committee meeting to order members of the public advise that our meetings are webcast live by the city of Hamilton and are archived on our city website. And uh, we're going to do a roll call to begin things. I am here as chair, Jason Farr, John Paul Danko, Councillor Danko. Present. Uh, Councillor Johnson has advised she was unable to attend today. Councillor Collins. Councillor Partridge. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Councillor Wilson. Good morning. And Councillor Pearson. Present. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And Madam Clerk, looking for changes to the agenda at this time. Yes, Mr. Chair, there are changes. We have an added delegation request 5.1 from Linda Lukasik, Environment Hamilton, respecting item 9.2, which is comments on proposed amendment one to a place to grow and revise land needs assessment methodology. And we have an added private and confidential report 13.1, appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal on the city of Hamilton's refusal or neglect to adopt an amendment to the city of Hamilton zoning bylaw number 05-200 for lands located at at 1190 Main Street West, 43 to 55 Forsyth Avenue South, 75 to 115 Tremor Avenue and 50 Dalewood Avenue, Hamilton. All right, I need a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as amended. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. All in favor? <clears throat> Hold on, oh, one sec. It's coming. Hang on. What? Sorry. Give me a second. Take your time. It's telling me the re request to speak is active. <sighs> got it. Yeah, I've got it. It's coming. There we go. of interest seeing none uh those who've noted a conflict please ensure okay we don't have any conflicts um looking for a mover and a seconder to approve the minutes of the august 11th 2020 meeting as presented and if there's any discussion i can have that now moved by councillor pearson seconded by councillor denko all in favor this is the, that's fine I'm I'm speaking quickly too. Right. I pass this now we seek a mover for the delegation from Linda Lukasik for today's meeting. Moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Farr. All in favor? Just a reminder, members of staff, if you're speaking at today's meeting, to offer up your uh, name and your title before speaking for the first time. On to public hearings. The public has been advised of how to pre register to be a virtual delegate at this public meeting and on today's agenda. And no members of the public have pre registered to be virtual delegates at any of the public meetings on today's agenda. Uh, minus Linda Lukasik, I guess, or is that? Okay, gotcha. Members of the public, in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the City of Hamilton before Council makes a decision regarding a zoning bylaw amendment and official plan amendment applications before us today, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Council of the City of Hamilton to the local planning appeal tribunal, and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of any appeal before the local planning appeal tribunals unless in the opinion of the tribunal 
there are reasonable grounds to do so. Seven one is an application to amend the city of Hamilton zoning bylaw number 6593. These are for lands located at 1406 Upper Gage Avenue in Ward 6. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation on this? Councillor Pearson, no? Waiting. No, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to waive this and I believe the board councillor has contacted us. Okay, so seconder, Judy Par Councillor Partridge moved and seconded to waive the staff presentation. All in favor? Marcus from IBI, you're in attendance. Are you in support of the staff report? We saw you earlier. Here I am. Hi, Jared. How are you? I'm doing well, Mr. Chair. How about yourself? I don't have that COVID beard going, but uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. It's uh, taken some effort, and uh, some, uh, you know, I have to ignore my colleagues who make fun of it. But you know, uh, that's all right. <laughs> it's good. Looks good. Get ready for the bush. Okay. Are you okay with this staff report, Jared? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have uh, we have read the staff report. We do. Uh, we are happy with the recommendations. Um, we would like to make one request though. We do have a final stage three archeological report, which is subject to the holding. And that's with the Mississauga First Credit Nation for review before it goes to the MTCS uh, for final approval. And we'd love if that could get waived, um, uh, get that re holding removed. It would uh, save our clients some time and money and uh, speed things up for us. So that would be our only request. Uh, if there are any questions from this committee, we'd be happy to try to answer those. Okay, uh, appreciating that request. It is a holding provision. Uh, I would ask actually uh, Michael, our staff, Michael Fiorneo, if uh, you've had a, a chance to dialogue with Jared on this request in advance of the meeting. So if uh, Michael can make himself present. Good, good morning, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so we did receive the uh, report uh, late last week. Uh, however, due to uh, the clearance being required is both from city perspective as well as the ministry. Uh, at this time, we wouldn't be able to waive that uh, condition at this time. Councillor Partridge. Councillor Partridge. Councillor, start from the beginning. Your audio just kicked in. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, I agree with staff. I'm not prepared to waive any conditions when it comes to archaeological assessments without the proper process and protocol. So I would uh, not be in favor of removing that hold at this point. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, unfortunately, the, the time and expense looks like it's going to remain, but uh, I, I don't even see a mover, Jared, to uh, assist you in your or your your late hour request on this one, but uh, I appreciate your efforts, so we'll have to stick with the holding uh, provision. And uh, other than that, I'm, I'm assuming, Jared, you're in support with, of the rest of the staff report? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay, I appreciate your efforts and sorry we can't accommodate you here today. Uh, as we do not have any other members of the public register to speak to this item, I'm going to oh, move to receive Jared. Yeah, uh, moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Danko. All in favor? I'll need a mover and a seconder to close the public meeting. That's moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. All in favor? The staff report to approve this application with the amendment that there were no public submissions received on this matter. Moved by. Uh, Partridge, seconded by Pearson. Councillor Partridge, did you want to speak to this? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. No, I, thank you. I just wanted to say I graciously put my name forward to uh, to support the staff report and recommendation. 
Excellent. And seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor, everyone? So that's good to go, right? Oh, okay. Mover and second to approve the report recommendations as amended. The amendment was the uh, no public submissions. Moved by Councillor Partridge, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Um, next up is 7-2, applications for an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 527 Shaver and 629 Garner, Ancaster, Ward 12. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation on this item today? I see no wish. Uh, I need to move on a sector then to waive that staff presentation. That's moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. All in favor to waive the staff presentation. I'm fine. Are you okay with this staff report? Actually, if I could have the ear of committee for just a moment, there's of course. two items I'd just like to bring to their attention. Sure. Um, now, the best way for me to cut to the chase would just be to jump to one or two slides uh, in my presentation. Uh, so I'll just take... Um, if, if I need to share my content or if the host would, would have my presentation on the screen. Hold on, say again. He is, he has the instruction to share his screen and he shows the presentation. Yeah, you, you've been instructed to share your screen and showing yourself your presentation. Are you okay to do that, Matt? I am, uh, just okay. bear with me. Yeah, yeah. Moment. Take, take your time, He's he's got it. Um, if you need some guidance, we have uh, an expert in our clerk who can uh, walk you through it. I am almost there. Okay, buddy. There you go. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, again, good afternoon or good morning, uh, members of the committee, staff, and the public. My name is Matt Johnston, a registered professional planner with Urban Solutions. I won't go through the slide show in full detail as we are in full uh, agreement with the staff recommendation. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Steve Robichaud, Anita Fayback, Beth Robinski, and Emily Bent for their hard work in getting us here today. Uh, what we're doing here is the last, it's almost really like a phase development um, directly to our east. The applicant, Dicento Homes has um, in the process of building out the townhouse development directly to the east, and we're carrying that same built form to the subject lands highlighted in red. Now to jump to the main topic of discussion, we're, we're looking at a 24 unit townhouse development. This concept has been reviewed with Councillor Ferguson, again in detail with staff, and there were two items in the zoning bylaw that um, we're almost just sort of uh, just missed the mark, but the intent was certainly there. And I'll jump to the final slide that illustrates this best. Um, one is uh, distance from a property line to a parking space at 3.3 meters. This was always the case on the concept agreed upon with staff and the ward councillor, but the bylaw spoke to the setback directly below where it is a full 3.5, whereas this driveway is 3.3. The second matter relates to the setback from the daylight triangle, which is the provision highlighted in red. We spent a bit of time with staff ensuring that we had uh, an enjoyable rear yard with a full six meters directly behind the unit. Now, in the bylaw that got translated into uh, five and a half meters to the hypotenuse of this triangle. 
uh, with the intention of capturing the six meters. However, when we take it to the closest point, it's 4.3. So those two technical changes um, always capture the intent of the preferred plan. Um, yesterday afternoon, I, I had a conversation with Yvette uh, and Steve Robichaud on both of these matters. And we also had some communication with Councillor Ferguson to ensure that we're all on the same page. And I would ask that um, a motion be brought forward to direct staff to incorporate these two minor revisions uh, technical changes into the bylaw. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm seeing no questions at this time. I don't think. Councillor Partridge, sorry, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I don't have questions for Matt, but I do have questions for staff and a, and a comment. So if you want to come back to me when appropriate, or I can do it now. I think you we have to it. receive Matt's presentation first. Any other questions for Matt then? I'll, I'll just uh, hand the chair back to, oh, Councillor Wilson, go ahead. Um, thank you. I, I don't have a question on these proposed amendments. I, I do, uh, it's been a while since I read the report um, through to Matt or perhaps Mr. Chair, it's better for staff. Um, I recall um, there was reference to a sound barrier wall being proposed. Could you clarify that for me, please? Is that the case? Mr. Chair, I, through the councillor, that is correct. We do have some noise attenuation along uh, this interface here on the screen wrapping around the daylight triangle. Sorry, can you, I just had to switch my screen. Could you indicate the location again, please? That is a wrapping around the daylight triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and what is, do you, do you know what the traffic count is on Shaver Road that would warrant that? Um, we did have a noise study submitted with the application, one of a number of technical supporting studies. Um, the, I, I don't know the trip generation that triggered the need for the noise study, but what we do know is that the receptors in that location um, require the mitigation in order to keep the sound below the MOE uh, requirements. Okay. I guess that's one of um, one of the benefits of, of a new development and you can make room for uh, those kind of mitigation um, measures that places in already established city, we, we, we can't do that. So hence our struggle with complete streets. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, just so I'm clear, uh, pass the chair to Councillor Danko. Matt, uh, you have a ward councillor and councillor Ferguson that's fine with this uh, modification? Yes, and I believe um, he provided correspondence on that uh, last night. Oh, it's uh, in my inbox? He sent it to the committee members? He did. Oh, great. I'll find that. I'll track that down. Okay, we have some questions for staff. I'll take the chair back. Um, we'll receive Matt's presentation, moved by councillor Partridge, seconded by councillor Danko. All in favor? Thank you. Stay with us, Matt. And I think we had Councillor Partridge first off. Question for staff. From Matt that came in, uh, as he said, last night at 5.50. And then there was a, a correspondence from Councillor Ferguson that was sent at, um, I believe, eight o'clock. And um, it doesn't say anything about the changes that we just spoke about. It doesn't say anything about the 3.3 meter, doesn't say anything about the daylight triangle. What it does talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, is revising the concept plan in consultation with staff to include a six meter rear yard setback from the daylight triangle to ensure this end had an appropriate re-yard. And then it does talk about the regulation to ensure a 5.5 meter setback to the daylight triangle 
in another area. And Ms. Uh, Councillor Ferguson's response to that was, I have no objection to the recommendation or the proposed amendment. The amendment he's referring to is referring to this. So the question to uh, Steve Robichaud, there's nothing in this email that talks about the 3.3 or the 3.5. So um, I, I don't know how Councillor Ferguson feels about that, but I'm just wondering if uh, staff are okay with this. Uh, to you, Mr. Chairman, to the ward councillor, the requested changes that by Mr. Johnson are very technical in nature and are consistent with the concept plan that's attached as Appendix E to the staff report. Um, <laughs> essentially, they're just to ensure that there are no problems at either the site plan or the condominium stage that would trigger the need for a committee of adjustment application. And as such, planning staff have no objections or concerns with the modifications being requested by Mr. Johnson this morning. Okay, thank you. And uh, does anyone have any idea how Councillor Ferguson feels about this? Because this is different than what I'm seeing in his email. To you, Mr. Chairman, I did speak to the ward councillor yesterday, and he indicated that he had no concerns or objections to this development proposal, because um, I did want to just touch base with him to make sure he was comfortable with it. And he mm -hmm. indicated that, um, and we talked about the concept plan, and he was fine with what was shown on the concept plan in this development proposal. All right, thank you. I'm fine You're with welcome. it then. Councillor Wilson. Chair. I've already asked my question, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we have received uh, the rep from Urban Solutions. We've asked questions of staff. I look now to a mover and a seconder to receive the public submissions in this report. That is moved by. Matt, can you take your screen off the. <clears throat> Thank you. There you go. Thanks, buddy. Moved by. Do I have a mover? Mover, Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Danko. All in favor? This is to receive the public submissions to the report. A mover and a seconder to close the public meeting. That is moved by Councillor Danko, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? By the applicant, uh, it's, it's a very clear that Steve Robichaud can. Uh, Put the wording down if you don't already have the wording down, uh, Clerk Chairman. Who has it? Who has it? You've got it. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. You're all in favor? Or to approve the application with an amendment that the public submissions received in the staff report on this matter did not affect the decision. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Danko. All in favor? Oh, Councillor Pearson wishes to speak. Just use your talk as, symbol. As Go amended? Ahead. As amended? Well, not yet. We don't do the as amended part yet. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, all in favor? Ankle will second to approve now the report recommendations as amended. All in favor. Five. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation on this? 
Uh, I don't see. Uh, so I'll move her in a second to, to uh, Councillor Partridge. Would you like to? Uh, yeah, say, I'll move it. Okay, waving the staff presentation, seconded by yep. Councillor Pearson. All in favor? <clears throat> okay, and uh, move on a second to, to receive the written submission. Moved by Councillor Danko, seconded by Councillor Wilson. All in favor? Uh, we don't have any members of the public registered to speak to this item, so I look to a mover and a seconder to close the public meeting. Moved by Councillor Partridge, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Finally, uh, look to a mover and a seconder regarding the staff report to approve the application with amendment to the public submissions received on this matter that they did not affect the decision. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. We're not going to vote yet. I, I have myself on the speaker's list unless there's someone before me. Is there someone? No. Uh, so I'll pass the chair to Councillor Danko. I have worked with uh, General Manager Thorne. Uh, regarding uh, my area <clears throat> on A, I have a, a suggestion for um, a small amendment. Uh, so where it says that notwithstanding subsection 4.20D of the City of Hamilton Zoning Bylaw 05200, that, and I wanted to put that the proposed bylaw attached as Appendix A to report PED 2135 be amended to permit live or recorded music amplified music and audio video presentation, including televised sports and entertainment on any outdoor commercial patio that may be permitted within the downtown area pursuant to such a bylaw. And um, through you, Chair Danko, to Jason, if he's present, I believe he is. Um, yes, so this, this ties in with uh, a, a, a council mandate from a few years back, moved by, I believe, our mayor and seconded by Councillor Jackson uh, to permit in the downtown amplified uh, uh, sounds on patios, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. So there was a council direction back in 2017 uh, to permit on uh, on outdoor patios, uh, music or um, like a, a television to show a sporting event um, within certain areas of the downtown, uh, but not within all areas of the downtown. So at the moment, there are portions of the downtown where you could do this and portions where you could not. Um, so the, the intent of, of, of the motion as you presented it would be to extend that same permission that some areas of the downtown have to the rest of the downtown. Okay, and I have a... I'm getting some feedback. Somebody's not muted. Sounds like it's okay. uh, the problem is taking it care of itself. Okay, okay. Uh, and I have uh, end zone sports bar has reached out um, and probably to the councillor as well. So they're they're the premier sports bar in town. They have unfortunately what is clearly in my view a uh, neighborhood to dispute with a particular neighbor who who seeks out just about everything they could possibly seek out and bylaws visited and they've uh, definitely uh, worked very closely with bylaw. They're a great neighbor. They've got uh, a large petition of people supporting their patio. Um, but one of the things more recently, and especially with the return of uh, basketball, the return of hockey, uh, the return of uh, uh, baseball, and being a sports bar, they have a number of, um, of clients, of, of customers that wish to stay outside for their own safety reasons. They don't want to go indoors. Um, they attempted to put a TV on their wall, a, a big screen TV. The, the volume was minimal, but because uh, they're outside 
side of the downtown Jason. They uh, obviously received a visit. They received a complaint, as they do, uh, from this particular individual. I've actually requested that they uh, try to get a neighborhood dispute resolution meeting with this with this neighbor, <clears throat> which is a program we've been offering for years here at the city of Hamilton. But in the interim, as a premier sports bar, and if they were to... Um, um, and I hate being really specific, particularly outside my ward, but if they were to, if we were to consider an, an, an amendment specific to that location that speaks to a 0.9 decibel, I think 0.9 is the conversational decibel through you, uh, Councillor Danko, to Jason, is that correct? Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, I, I believe it's 60 decibels is what we, uh, we, we permit um, up to. Okay, so that that's uh, conversational. That's the sound of an HVAC unit, something similar to that. Uh, through you, Mr. Sherry, yeah, I actually believe that when when this was introduced back in 2017, it was it was suggested that it's more or less the volume of a of a, of a council meeting in terms of a conversational volume. Okay, so if I can get an, a seconder for that location at that volume to permit ATV on this uh, massive sports bar's patio to accommodate some of their uh, customers who wish not to be indoors at this time, but wish to get out and enjoy uh, some of the great sport events that have returned, I would uh, appreciate getting a seconder on that. It's site specific, it's outside of the downtown, so outside of this amendment, but I would include it in the amendment if there's someone that could second that. I'll second it. To uh, th thank you, Councillor Danko. Uh, it's on the floor, and um, I'll, I'll let you keep the chair. It looks like you have Councillor Wilson. Yeah. So, speakers on. So, Councillor Farr, can you just reiterate specifically what's yeah, what you're moving? Okay. Yeah. In A, uh, I'm proposing a by the the uh, the bylaw attached to Appendix A, be amended to permit live or recorded music, amplified music, and audio video presentations, including televised sports and entertainment on any outdoor commercial patios that may be permitted within the downtown area, so Ward 2, uh, uh, pursuant to such bylaw. And in addition to that, uh, the specific, uh, the same goes for the specific address as it relates to um, televised sports at End Zone Bar and Grill. And I'm sorry, I don't know their address. It's on Main Street between Ottawa and Kennel. Okay, thank you. So discussion on the amendment. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Danko. Um, to uh, the mover, has the ward councillor uh, been consulted? Uh, I believe that's Ward 3. It's a, This is the one across from Delta, correct? Yeah, yes. Uh, ward four. I spoke to oh, one. Uh, ward sorry. four. Uh, no, no problem. I spoke to one of the owners through you, Chair, and uh, they had said they had had uh, talked to the ward councillor. Between now and council, I'm sure um, uh, we can get something firm from uh, councillor uh, uh, Marula. It's ward four. Uh, I, I haven't had an opportunity. I haven't had an opportunity, but uh, the, the, this came pretty quickly last night, and uh, I thought I'd throw it in since I was I had an amendment anyway as it relates to my ward. I I, I, can't, I can't give you a definitive on where the councillor would stand, but I can tell you that it's a sports bar, and I'm not. The, no one is seeking to crank up the the the, the ball. Thank you. My my second it's question. Just, just to have one TV outside, that's all. Thank you. My, quest, my second question in terms of process, you referenced um, a, a mitigation service that the city offers. And I'm wondering uh, through uh, Chair Denko to staff, um, what would be the implications of including this in the permissive bylaw for this activity and then um, going to, to mitigation because clearly it would thereafter favor one of the parties over the others. Would that be a correct um, assessment? So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, no, I don't think so because there's, there's an important distinction to be made. What the temporary use bylaw that's in front of you would do um, as amended if, if, if council approves the amendment put forth by Councillor Farr only deals with the zoning implications. So it would permit for example, a television to be put on the on the on a patio under zoning, it does not change the noise bylaw. Um, so if there is a noise concern, um, then that would still be enforceable under the noise bylaw. 
um, and what we would normally do if there's a contravention of the noise bylaw, so if the TV is turned up too loudly, for example, um, then um, we would enforce the noise bylaw and, and uh, that generates a discussion with the property owner around how to mitigate. So the simplest thing being to turn down the volume, uh, but if there is a dispute around the noise bylaw, that is something that um, in the past um, staff has assisted with sort of mediation between between a neighbor and and a business owner um, with respect to the noise bylaw. So uh, what this bylaw does, it just removes the zoning prohibition against, um, for example, a TV being present. It does not change the fact that the TV still has to be at a volume that is in keeping with the noise bylaw. Um, and so I think that's where the councillor is suggesting that if that continues to be a concern, that that's where um, some, some mediation and mitigation can be done. Oh, thank you. That was helpful. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm a little uneasy about um, making amendments for uh, specific um, establishments uh, because in the absence of a, a discussion, particularly um, not hearing from the ward councillor, but I'll, I'll wait to hear from uh, what my other colleagues have to say. Thank you. Further discussion on the, the motion that's on the floor? So, Councillor Partridge is next, and then you can throw me back on the list, please. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, um, thank you, Chair. I, I'm I'm a little bit uneasy about this as well. I have to agree with um, the previous speaker. Without hearing from the ward councillor, and and I'm just I'm just wondering. I mean, I support downtown, as you know, uh, Councillor Farr, 100 percent. Um, what I'm concerned about, what, what is to stop other uh, businesses from coming forward in other areas of the city and asking for exactly the same exemption? Perhaps staff should answer that. Um. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Chair, and we can certainly between now and council work with the, the, the board councillors to make sure that the geographic areas, both for the downtown area and for this location are appropriately defined, because we would want to make sure that's clearly defined in the temporary use bylaw. Um, there is some precedent for what the councillor is suggesting back in 2017 uh, when the temporary use bylaw was brought forward to permit this type of uh, use on a patio in the different in different parts of the city, um, the pilot project areas. Some of those were, were um, general areas of the city, like for example, um, there was a, an area of James North that was included of multiple properties. Some of them were site specific, primarily in the in the rural area. We dealt with um, a lot of them were golf courses, uh, things like that, um, were specifically identified as as property addresses as opposed to broad regions. So the temporary use bylaw as it exists today um, for uh, music and amplified sound on patios has a mix of what I would call sort of clusters of, of parcels as well as individual parcels um, is, is contemplated in the bylaw as it currently stands. Uh, but like I said, um, if, if, um, if if committee wishes to, to support the motion related to this area outside of the downtown, then we can certainly make sure that we've properly defined the geography in the bylaw prior to it coming to council. I think that would be my preference and thank, and thank you for, for reminding me about the uh, the temporary use bylaw being extended to specifics outside. I remember we did do that. In fact, it includes some in my area as well. Um, and, I, and I guess in terms of the noise bylaw, the um, <clears throat> if what is being allowed or suggested is is to be about the um, the level of conversation. My concern is that when you're uh, in in a restaurant, or bar, any kind of a a location, a patio conversation level um you know uh tends to increase as the sounds of tvs or other um music so you know it becomes amplified and it could be an ongoing problem but i i would like to see i think at the end of the day what what is needed here even um once this bylaw is passed or not passed is some form of um, facilitation between the the property owners and and I, and I think what I did hear staff say and correct me if I'm wrong is that that mitigate that that facilitation would not necessarily take place uh, until there was another complaint and I'm almost thinking that we need to be a little preemptive here and and uh, proactive and have that discussion beforehand and I believe that was suggested by um, Councillor Wilson as well. So did I hear correctly that that would not take place at this point? 
through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we can certainly reach out um, to the to the property owner because I do understand there have been some some uh, complaints that have come in uh, uh, previously, and we can see if we can um, uh, assist with it with a resolution um, around how to mitigate the noise impact um, on the patio as it exists today. Um, regardless of whether or not ultimately it is it, the permission is extended to include televisions we we can certainly have that conversation now we don't have to uh, wait for the um, for the passage of the temporary use bylaw yeah and and thank you for that Jason because I really I really do feel that um, you know we we uh, we have that program available to be able to help neighbors work together when there is this type of um, you know continued complaint and I think if we're going to pass bylaw, then it would uh, only be respectful to reach out to to both parties and and um, and have that discussion on you know how can we how can we resolve this going forward? So I mean, based on everything I've heard, I will support uh, the motion going forward. Um, but I would like to see some um, you know some some uh, uh, tweaking, if you will, and and also hear from the word councillor uh, when we have council on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. And just a couple questions for me, if there's nobody else on the speakers list there. Okay. I'm, I'm a second time. Um, so to, to staff, I guess I'm, I'm sharing the unease from committee of making a bylaw specifically for one property. So in the, the outdoor commercial patios bylaw, for example, we identify certain conditions and areas where these can go. I, I don't think this is a big deal at all. I would be in favor of extending this to everywhere we've allowed an outdoor patio. Um, but to to extend it to just one specific property um, opens up a, you know, a whole can of worms. We're going to start doing this all over the city. So through to staff, could we define this as part of the outdoor commercial patio program or as it's all, or added specifically added to the uh to the outdoor um commercial was it entertainment on outdoor commercial patios that we already defined so, so it applies you, broadly to to everywhere not just one specific property so through you mr chair the uh the current permissions under the, the the temporary use bylaw from back in 2017 that permits um, i'm just going to refer to it as music on patios um, or entertainment on patios i think is what we called it in the report um, currently that permission applies um, to a number of areas across the city that as, as i said earlier are either um, uh, clusters of properties for example it covers james north between i think it was cannon and barton uh, something like that, as well as it applies to some individual properties, primarily in the rural area. And each of those geographic areas are defined within that temporary use bylaw. Uh, so the intention of this amendment would be that uh, essentially just further geographic areas would be provided that same uh, permission. So uh, the downtown area um, is part of the motion. Uh, right now, it's only portions of the downtown area, so this would extend that to the to the full downtown area. Um, and then whatever committee directs in terms of the, 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 the end zone property or the area around the end zone property um, would be just an, another defined geographic area within the temporary use bylaw. So uh, the permissions that they'd be granted would be the same as what exists uh, in, in various other parts of the city under that 2017 temporary use bylaw. Thank you. Um, other speakers, second time. Councillor Pearson, did you want to speak to this? Well, sorry, Mr. Acting Chairman. I just, um, I, I am concerned. I do, I do not wish to open this up to all areas as far as music on the patio. So um, I do have concerns with end zone as well and making it one specific, but I do have a concern of opening it up all over the place. And I respect the end zone property they have a brick wall on the north side and they have their building. So they're, and it's, well, I believe they own the property across the street as well. And then it's Delta High School. So, I mean, they are pretty well um, blocked off from residential, but I have numerous patios that are very close to residential. I would not want to have music or, or TVs on the patio, believe it or not. I actually get complaints for residents that have TVs on their patios in their backyards. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Second time, Councillor Farrow. Yeah, I'll, I, I'm going to take the end zone right out of the mix and just keep with my ward. Um, 
and uh, between now and possibly council uh, further engage, particularly with the ward councillor, to be very, very fair. Again, this was very last minute last night, and I very much appreciate the discussion and uh, the concerns and the questions. Uh, certainly, uh, some I uh, uh, recollect from a few years back when we were talking about ward wide and we were talking about amplified noise on patios in some of the suburban areas. Councillor Pearson just uh, tweaked my memory on that one. So I'll take the end zone bit right out. So the amendment would read in A, the proposed bylaw attached as appendix A to report PED 2135 be amended to permit live or recorded music, amplified music, and audio video presentations, including televised sports and entertainment. And that would be on any outdoor commercial patio that may be permitted within the downtown area pursuant, pursuant to such a bylaw. So specific to uh, uh, downtown uh, and as uh, originally um, uh, proposed when I brought the amendment forward, taking uh, Ward 4's end zone site specific right out of the mix and, and, and again, appreciating the uh, the debate here today. And I, a secondary, a secondary, I don't have a secondary. Uh, Councillor Denko, thank you. And you still, I, and you still have the uh, chair, Councillor Denko. So any- And you have Councillor Wilson and then Councillor Partridge. Wilson and then Partridge. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't need to ask my question now, uh, given um, Councillor Farr's um, proposal to, to take that specific property off. My question was pertaining to um, what kind of consultation we did previously with respect to the music and entertainment. And um, if Councillor uh, Farr is uh, going to be bringing something back, I, I can ask those questions then. So thank you. Okay. Councillor Partridge? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I really appreciate you taking the uh, the end zone uh, site specific right out of the mix. Um, I, I, can, I can support it. I was really, really uh, on uncomfortable with um, with that one being in there, and especially since it uh, came last minute, and we haven't heard from the ward council. So, thank you for doing that, Councilor. No problem. Okay. I'll so take the chair. Further speakers. So we'll vote on the amendment. All in favor? And then the uh, the report as amended. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're looking for a mover, and a, you want me to take the chair back now? Um. Yeah. I can take the chair back, Councillor. Thank you, Perfect. Councillor Dankel. Thank you. Um, uh, so we look for a mover and a seconder regarding the staff report to approve the application with the amendment that the public submissions received on this matter did not affect the decision. That's moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Collins. All in favor? Seconder to approve the report recommendations as amended. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Danko, all in favor? Everybody. Linda Lukasik, Environment Hamilton, respecting comments on proposed amendment one to a place to grow and revise land needs assessment methodology. Linda, uh, welcome back to our planning committee. It's good to have you virtually. Thank you very much, Chairperson Afar, and good morning to members of the planning committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide Environment Hamilton's comments to you regarding amendment number one of a place to grow 
the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe and the proposed land needs assessment methodology. I want to start by saying that much as was the case when I was here before this committee in February of 2019 on the last round of Ford government changes to the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Environment Hamilton concurs with the majority of the comments and recommendations made by planning staff on this amendment. And again, we're very appreciative of the detailed responses being prepared by staff um, to this constant barrage of planning policy changes from the provincial government. But there is one critically important element of the proposed provincial changes that is not addressed in the report from planning staff that I'm going to urge you to uh, incorporate into the City of Hamilton's response to the Ford government's amendments to the growth plan. Amendment number one includes a change that would allow aggregate pits and quarries to be located in the habitat of threatened and endangered um, species throughout the growth plan area's natural heritage system. Right now, aggregate extraction is prohibited in these critical habitats in these crucial habitats and given that the purpose of the natural heritage system is to protect biodiversity it's not unreasonable to prohibit aggregate extraction within the habitats of our most vulnerable plants and animals please send a strong message to the province that protecting the habitat of threatened and endangered species is the bare minimum that we should be requiring here and i also wanted to take the opportunity to speak to what has now become blatantly obvious uh, the Ford government is actively dismantling the planning policies that we urgently need right now to support an intensification first approach to growth management in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. These changes are pushing us back into the realm of what we know are extremely problematic approaches to growth that do not prioritize efficient land use, create compact, complete communities, protect our precious agricultural land and natural areas, or come anywhere near to helping us to build a climate resilient future. The approach has been described by a former senior planner with Municipal Affairs and Housing who played a central role in growth management planning during his time with the province as a systemic dismantling of the growth plan. To make matters worse, this approach is now being promoted as part of the provincial government's post-pandemic economic recovery strategy. So what have we seen so far? I just want to quickly run through. Um, 2019, the growth plan amendments brought us the following changes. Private landowners can now pursue urban boundary expansions of up to 40 hectares. Um, and you are all aware efforts are already underway on this front here in Hamilton. The province decreased the minimum greenfield density targets that apply in Hamilton from a, a target that was moving towards 80 people and jobs per hectare down to 50 as the minimum. Um, and the minimum intensification target in the built-up area from 60% to 50%. Again, so it is important to acknowledge that these are minimums targets and municipalities can commit to higher targets. And we always like to remind you of that. Um, and um, I want to acknowledge that committee and council did last year um, commit to a higher target with that stated acknowledgement that there is support for the 80 jobs and people per hectare target for greenfield areas. Wanted to make reference to Bill 197, the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act, which received royal assent on July uh, 21st, and that ushered in changes to the Planning Act that, according to the Canadian Environmental Law Association, quote, enhance provisions that already give the minister unilateral power to issue zoning orders. The revised border making power would allow the minister, and now does allow the minister, to reach deeply into the planning process at the level of the details of a specific project and site, thereby overruling decisions by municipal council and planning staff. And CELA goes on to state that, quote, although the, pr the proposal, now law, states that the new power will be exercised in relation to, quote, site plan control and inclusionary zoning, the last few months have seen a dramatic increase in the use of minister zoning orders in favor of the development industry. And this now continues at breakneck speed. And think about the brow lands and the decision um, that recently happened here in Hamilton. And I want you to be aware, if you're not, that there are many other ministerial zoning orders emerging in other parts of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Um, and a number of these are exacerbating problems with sprawl development. And one really egregious example is Carruthers Creek in Durham region. And then finally, the focus of the staff report today, the proposed changes to a place to grow set out in amendment number one, which include, I've already referenced more flexibility for siting of aggregate extraction operations, including them in um, the natural heritage system, even if it is habitat of threatened and endangered species, 
increasing the planning horizon out from 2041 to 2051, making it easier to justify more urban expansion or forcing municipalities in that direction in order to accommodate projected growth over a longer time frame, modifications to population and employment forecasts and the factors considered to establish these forecasts that will only serve to justify larger urban land needs, including modifications that would empower municipalities to exceed population and employment forecasts when undertaking land needs assessment. Happily, our planning staff don't support that change. And the associated proposed but still vague changes to the land needs assessment methodology that could take the growth plan away from target-based to, to more of a market demand-based approach to land needs assessment. And as you'll hear more, that's problematic as well. And I just want to finish by saying that all of this is incredibly disheartening. Um, we can't afford to let this happen, not right now. There are severe costs from an economic, social, and from an environmental point of view. And again, Environment Hamilton urges you to remain committed to doing everything that the municipality can to push back and to push forward with progressive intensification first approaches to accommodating growth in our community. This is the best way to plan for post-COVID recovery and returning to better than normal. We need to prepare too for the tsunami that is the climate emergency by building a city that is sustainable, climate resilient, and inclusive. Thanks very much. Thank you, Linda. Any questions? And Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you, Chair Fart. No, actually, I don't have a question, uh, but I, I, I really want to take this uh, opportunity, if you'll give me some leverage, to commend Environment Hamilton because they underscored uh, exactly what is going on here uh, with this uh, provincial government in that they are using um, methodology uh, to uh, cover up what is a clear intent to uh, create a, a future Ontario which is not going to be climate resilient um, and which um, is also going to cost uh, residential uh, taxpayers enormously uh, because we know growth does not pay, pay for itself and in fact adds uh, just um, significantly to the infrastructure deficit that is ours. It's completely in the wrong direction. And I'm just grateful that uh, Linda, uh, Dr. Lukasik called it for what it is. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, move to receive, moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Discussion items, amendments to the general provisions of the business licensing bylaw 07170. Any discussions on 91? Committee. Moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Amendment one to a place to grow revised land needs assessment methodology, as just discussed. Um, does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? I have Councillor Wilson interested, Councillor Danko, Councillor Pearson. All right, so uh, we will um, see the staff presentation. I'm not sure which staff, probably Joanne Hickey Evans. Oh, Heather Travis. Heather, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. And now I can see you. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to share my presentation. Yep. Can you see it on the screen? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. The report before you today summarizes staff's comments on two recently proposed provincial planning changes. On June 16, 2020, the province released two postings on the Environmental Registry of Ontario for review and comment. 
The first is the proposed amendment number one to a place to grow growth plan for the greater golden horseshoe. And the second is a proposed update to the land needs assessment methodology for a place to grow. The deadline for comments for these two postings was July 31st, 2020. Staff submitted comments to the province by the deadline. Any revisions or modifications by council today will be forwarded to the province as the city's formal comments on the ERO postings. I'll start today with the changes proposed through amendment one to the growth plan. Just as a little bit of background, the growth plan 2019 is a provincial plan that sets the direction for accommodating growth and development in the city and surrounding municipalities in the greater Golden Horseshoe. The growth plan identifies population and employment forecasts throughout municipalities and sets out minimum targets related to intensification and density, which the city must plan to achieve. Through the municipal comprehensive review process, the city is required to update its official plans to conform to the requirements of the growth plan by the year 2022. So the key changes proposed in, Ham in, amendment, in amendment one, which impact on the city of Hamilton, are an extended planning horizon to the year 2051, whereas the current growth plan 2019 plans to the year 2041, and updated population and employment forecasts to the year 2051 for each municipality. The staff's key concerns with the proposed amendment number one changes are listed on the screen, and I'll go through each of these now in more detail. First area of concern is the revised population and employment forecasts, which are found in Schedule 3 to the growth plan. The chart on the screen shows the existing Schedule 3 forecasts for the City of Hamilton for 2031 and 2041 for both population and jobs in the top two rows on the screen. The chart also shows the proposed new forecasts for the city to the year 2051. The draft amendment one released for public comment identifies three different forecast scenarios, a reference low and a high scenario for population and job growth. And the province is asking for feedback on which scenario should ultimately be used. The draft amendment indicates that the reference scenario is the most probable future growth forecast. And you'll note that the reference scenario sees Hamilton's population increase to 820,000 um, in 2051 and jobs increase to 360,000. The process that the city must undertake to identify how and where the additional people and jobs will be accommodated is the update to the city's growth strategy, GRIDS 2, and the MCR, or Municipal Comprehensive Review. City staff have been working on GRIDS 2 and the MCR for the last few years with a focus on how growth to the year 2041 will be accommodated. The planning horizon for GRIDS 2 and the MCR will now be extended to 2051. In planning for how and where the additional growth will be accommodated, there are multiple options to consider, including intensification within the existing urban built-up area, increasing the density of future development in the city's greenfield areas, and or urban expansion into the city's white belt land which I'll go over in a moment. So through GRIDS 2 and the MCR, we will examine how much of the proposed growth can be accommodated through intensification and increased density of development of the city's greenfield lands. Ultimately, a land needs assessment will be completed, which will identify how much of the city's future growth can be accommodated within the existing urban area and how much may need, be, may need to be accommodated through urban expansion. So if the land needs assessment identifies a need for additional land to be added to the urban boundary to accommodate growth, the options for where that growth can occur are limited. Within rural Hamilton, lands that are not within the Greenbelt plan area are often referred to as white belt lands. Urban expansion can only take place into the white belt lands and not within the Greenbelt plan area, with a small exception for Binbrook and Waterdown. As you can see on the slide, the vast majority or 94% of rural Hamilton is within the Greenbelt plan area only 5% of the land area is considered to be white belt land. The white belt land is further constrained by several factors which prohibit or limit the amount of development that can occur, including natural heritage features and rights of way. In addition, a significant portion of the white belt lands are located above the 28 NEF contour of the airport and can therefore only be considered for employment or non-sensitive land uses. After these constraints are considered, approximately 1,600 hectares of net land area is available in the White Belt to accommodate residential growth. So for several reasons, including the city's limited greenfield land supply, an intensification market that is still emerging, and constraints on the city's White Belt lands, 
staff are recommending that the final schedule of three population and employment forecast for Hamilton in the growth plan should be the reference or the low scenario and not the high scenario as identified on the slide. The second area of concern identified by staff is the extended planning horizon to 2051. The extended horizon to 2051 is significant. It is difficult at present to anticipate future social, economic and market shifts, which can influence future growth. Look at what has occurred this year, which could not have been foreseen. The concern about planning for growth so far in the future is that planning for growth that does not occur can create financial challenges to the municipality if the city's actual population or job growth does not keep pace with the forecasted growth. The city will not collect enough in development charges to pay for infrastructure investment, leading to debt financing future growth with, re with related financial implications. So for these reasons, staff are recommending that the growth plan policy should be revised to provide flexibility to municipalities in planning for growth from 2041 to 2051 by not requiring municipalities to designate land to accommodate the growth, but rather to identify a strategy for how the growth will be accommodated. This will avoid issues with over designating land for future development and will allow the city to monitor trends and targets prior to additional lands being added to the urban area in the future. The next area of concern is a policy shift proposed in Amendment 1, which will allow municipalities to plan for a higher forecast than what is shown in, this, in the growth plan Schedule 3. Under the current growth plan 2019, municipalities must plan for the Schedule 3 forecasts, and there is absolutely no option to plan for an alternative forecast. Under the proposed revisions in Amendment 1, there is an opportunity to plan for a higher forecast, but not a lower forecast. There is no information provided as to how or why a higher forecast could be justified. Staff are concerned with this change. Staff are concerned that the MCR process could face delays if there are debates surrounding the appropriate forecast to plan toward. If the grids to and MCR process is delayed, there will be corresponding delays on the updates to the city's master plans and development charges bylaw, which are reliant on the outcome of grids two to move forward. There are also questions about the regional planning implications of allowing certain municipalities to plan for higher forecasts and what would be the implications on other municipalities' growth outlooks. This change could have the effect of compromising the original purpose of the growth plan to allocate growth based on a regional planning lens. So based on these concerns, staff are putting forward the recommendations on the screen. The city does not support the proposed revisions to allow municipalities to plan for higher forecasts. The existing policy wording of the growth plan 2019 should be maintained, which requires municipalities to plan for the forecast in Schedule 3 and do not provide any opportunities for municipalities to consider higher forecasts. As an alternative to the above recommendation, if the province maintains the revision to the policies to allow for the higher forecasts, the policy should be revised to state clearly that only councils may request an increased Schedule 3 forecast with appropriate and significant justification which would require approval from the minister. The next area of concern identified by staff is related to interim year forecasts, which is the inclusion of forecasts for the years 2031 and 2041 on Schedule 3 to the growth plan. In the draft amendment one released for public comment, there were two versions of Schedule 3 released for each of the, the scenarios, a mock A and a mock B version they were called. The Mach A version included forecasts for 2031, 2041, and 2051, whereas the Mach B version only included the forecast to 2051. It's important to note that the 2031 and 2041 numbers are shown on Mach A for information purposes only. The city is only required to plan toward the 2051 forecast. And also important to note that the 2031 and 2041 forecasts in the Mach A version have been carried forward from the uh, existing version of Schedule 3 in the Growth Plan 2019 and have not been updated. So there was also a technical background report released with the draft amendment number one update, which was prepared by Hemson Consulting. Hemson was retained by the province to update the population and employment forecasts for all growth plan municipalities. The background document provides a review of the methodology and assumptions behind the updated forecasts, as well as tables and an appendix to the report containing the updated forecast for each municipality. 
But it's important to note that for Hamilton, the updated population and employment forecasts for 2031 and 2041 by Hemson are lower for all of the scenarios referenced low and high than the existing Schedule 3 forecasts for Hamilton. The graphs on the side illustrate this point. The blue lines show the referenced low and high growth plan Schedule 3 forecasts for population on the left and jobs on the right. The orange lines show the Hempson forecast. You'll note that for 2051, the growth plan and the Hempson numbers align. But for the years 2031 and 2041, the growth plan forecast is higher than the new Hempson numbers. The Hempson forecasts result in a more gradual and consistent rate of growth, particularly from 2021 to 2041. Staff's concern is that the interim year forecasts for 2031 and 2041 on Schedule 3 are artificially inflating the rate of growth for the city. Staff understand the reason the province is proposing to keep the 2031 and 24 numbers the same as the current and not use the updated Hemson numbers is because many municipalities have already started their MCR planning processes and use, use the existing numbers and the province doesn't want to slow down or impede that work. However, staff have long identified issues with the forecast in the existing Schedule 3 for Hamilton for those interim years, which see the city experiencing exponential growth during this period. Staff find that the revised Hemson numbers reflect a more realistic and achievable growth forecast. And again, as previously mentioned, there is a concern over planning for growth that does not materialize. So staff are making the following recommendations. A mock B format in Amendment 1, which contains only the 2051 population and employment forecast with no interim year forecast is the preferred option for Schedule 3. And as an alternative, if the mock A format of Schedule 3 is approved, then the Hempson population employment forecast for the interim years should be incorporated into Schedule 3 rather than maintaining the current uh, 2019 Schedule 3 number. So the next area of concern is the housing by unit type forecast included in the Hempson background report. Appendix B in the Hempson report shows a breakdown of ground related versus apartment units forecast for the city to the year 2051 and shows a new unit forecast of 82% ground related, which would be singles, semis and towns and 18% apartments in the city of Hamilton. Staff find that this breakdown seems to underestimate the number of apartments which will be constructed going forward. Noting that the growth plan requires a minimum of 50% of the city's units to be in the form of intensification, which is anticipated to be primarily apartment units. And further looking at the city's actual housing unit mix based on new unit construction over the last five years, the breakdown was approximately 62% grant related and 38% apartments, which was already more than double the Hempson forecast going forward. The staff note that the Hempson unit breakdown is provided for information only and that the planned housing mix will continue to be decided by municipalities through our MCR process. But staff find that the inclusion of the Hempson breakdown as shown could lead to confusion going forward as the planned housing mix developed through the MCR will not align with the Hempson breakdown, creating debate and uncertainty in the process. So staff are making the recommendation that the housing by type forecast included in the Hempson report should be revised to reflect at a minimum, the growth plan policy requirements that provide a more, in order to provide a realistic housing unit breakdown for municipalities to reference. And as an alternative to the above, the housing by type forecast could be removed from the technical report, technical report altogether to avoid confusion. The final area of concern regarding Amendment 1 is regarding transition. The appeals to the city's rural and urban official plans are still before the LPAC. Staff are requesting clarity in the revised transition regulation to be issued for Amendment 1 to explicitly address the transition rules for the City of Hamilton and the Rural and Urban Official Plan Appeals and the applicable policy framework going forward. Though specifically as noted on the screen, staff are recommending that the LPAT proceedings regarding the 2011 ministry modifications to the Urban Official Plan and the 2009 modifications to the Rural Official Plan shall be continued and disposed of in accordance with the 2019 growth plan as amended, that the boundaries of the settlement area and the urban official plan shall not be modified by the LPAT and shall not be modified until a municipal comprehensive review has been completed, except in accordance with growth plan policies. 
Again, this is simply seeking clarification going forward as to the appropriate policy framework to apply to the LPAT proceedings. So moving on now to the second posting on the environmental registry, which was regarding the land needs assessment methodology. As a reminder, a land needs assessment is a study that determines the quantity of land that will be required to accommodate forecasted population and employment growth within the municipality. In 2018, the province released a land needs assessment methodology for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The standardized methodology was described in a detailed standalone document that clearly identified the approach to the completion of a land needs assessment, which all growth plan municipalities were required to use in the completion of their MCR work. There was some flexibility in the various data inputs and assumptions used in applying the method, but there could be no deviation in the mandated steps to be taken. The ERO posting is proposing to replace the detailed 28 methodology with a methodology that appears to provide greater flexibility in how the LNA must be completed. Under the revised approach, there is no longer a standalone methodology document with specific steps to be followed, but rather a much less formal identification of minimum requirements to be considered. So staff's concerns with this revised approach are shown on the screen. And once again, I'll quickly go through these, these three areas of concern. So the first area of concern is the lack of a standardized methodology now being proposed. The benefit of a standard, standardized methodology uh, being applied for each municipality to use in their MCR work is that it allows for easy comparison amongst municipalities and removes the opportunity for debate over the best approach to follow. Staff have a concern that the lack of detail in the new methodology will lead to debate and questioning over the best approach to complete the city's LNA, and that this defeats the purpose of establishing a methodology and may slow the city's grids to an MCR conformity exercise. So staff are recommending that the land needs assessment methodology must provide a detailed standardized approach to the completion of the LNA and remove any opportunities for doubt or debate regarding the approach to the LNA completion. The revised methodology should be presented in a detailed standalone document similar to the 2018 version. The next area of concern is the focus on more of a market-based approach to the completion of the land needs assessment. The proposed new method focuses much more on the concept of market-based demand and ensuring sufficient land supply is available to serve all segments of the housing market, referring to grant-related housing versus apartments as distinguished in the Hempson report. Staff are concerned that basing the LNA in part on market demand raises the question of how market demand is defined and how market demand can be reconciled with required minimum intensification and density targets. So in this regard, staff are recommending that if the province proposes to uh, come stick with this market-based approach as noted in the ERO posting, the province should provide greater detail as to how market demand is to be defined and provide direction on how municipalities can reconcile market demand with required growth plan targets. And the final area of concern in relation to the land needs assessment posting is regarding consultation requirements. Consultation is an important component of the grids to an MCR process. Consultation has and will continue to occur on important inputs into the land needs assessment, such as intensification density targets, and employment land conversions. But the completion of the LNA itself is a technical exercise, and it is staff's understanding that the 2018 method envisioned consultation on the LNA document with provincial staff only, as it is primarily a technical document. There is concern that new requirements for consultation, combined with the new direction to allow for potentially higher forecasts, and with the lack of a standard methodology, will result in significant deba debates and delays, again, to the overall process. So staff are recommending that the completion and approval of the land needs assessment could not require additional public consultation, potentially resulting in lengthy delays, as the completion of the LNA is a technical document, and it is understood that municipalities will have already consulted on LNA inputs, such as intensification and density targets. So once again, as noted, staff have uh, sent the comments that are attached to the staff report uh, to the province in advance of the July 31st commenting deadline. It was a, a very short window that we were provided in order to get the comments in on time. Uh, but uh, today's uh, staff report, including any changes requested by council, will be further submitted as the city's comments on the two postings. So thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Okay, we have, thank you, Heather. We have uh, Councilor Wilson first off. Thank you, Chair Farr. Um, first of all, I, I, I do want to give my sincere and incredible thanks to staff for um, Heather for this uh, really rich uh, report, which takes some, uh, so many complex um, and, and sneaky bits, if you will, from the government of Ontario and draws them out for us so that we can be held accountable. Um, so I'm very, very appreciative of, of it and I support all the recommendations, but I just have a few questions uh, seeking clarity. Um, one through you, Chair Farr, is on the definition, just so I'm clear, of white belt lands. Um, I'm just seeking clarity. Are, are white lands, which we've already, um, where we've already done an urban boundary expansion, but we haven't developed them as yet? Um, I'm, I'm just, I wasn't clear on whether the, uh, whether they're only in the rural areas or whether they're in the urban areas where we've done expansion, but we just haven't developed. Could you clarify that for me, please, through you, Chair? Yes, uh, through the Chair. Uh, what we call the White Belt lands are lands that are still considered rural. They're within the rural area, but they are not part of the Green Belt plan area. So that's why we use the term White Belt. It's actually not an officially defined term in any planning policy document, but it is what uh, it is a term that is commonly refused to differentiate, used to differentiate those lands from the green valley lands. But no, they, they do remain rural. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Lukasik referenced um, uh, a request that we should be um, making a comment or a recommendation about aggregate ex extraction. Would you care to comment on that recommendation? Uh, Yes, uh, through the chair. The reason that our staff report hadn't addressed that issue was uh, because this that proposed policy change to allow for the extraction in those sensitive areas uh, applies only to the growth plan area. It does not apply to the Greenbelt plan, uh, which is, as I noted in my presentation, the vast majority of the city's uh, rural Hamilton area is within the Greenbelt and it is protected. Um, aggregate extraction is not permitted within those sensitive features within the Greenbelt plan. Within the city's small amount of white belt land, we don't have any areas identified for potential aggregate or sand and gravel extraction. So in a Hamilton context, it was not seen as a significant area of concern, uh, but certainly from a wider point of view, more of a, a regional lens, uh, I would have no uh, objection to um, adding a comment on that uh, from a wider perspective of that the city doesn't support. Uh, extraction in those sensitive features. It's just that within Hamilton itself, it was not seen to be a significant area of concern. Well, uh, thank you. I, that, I think that makes sense to me. However, um, as our awareness of the um, connectivity of uh, habitats and how that impacts us downstream, if you will, I, I would favor my colleagues um, support for including some um, emphatic statement on that because ultimately it does affect our well-being. Um, the fourth question I have is I wasn't quite clear on um, uh, the, uh, was it the, the Hempson or was it the Government of Ontario remind me that the dip in the employment um, numbers and if you could just, are you able to comment on where you think that came from, the rationale behind that, that, that we would be going down on that? Um, through the chair, I, I think you may be referring to, so the, in the, the Hemson report, which identified the updated um, employment sure. forecast for the city of Hamilton, um, for all three of those scenarios, the reference, the high and the low, mm -hmm. uh, the city's employment numbers are, are lower than what is in the growth plan schedule three currently. And that's not really a surprise. Um, we know that we've been a little bit behind on, on jobs. We haven't been keeping up with the forecast and that's not just the city of Hamilton, that's all greater Golden Horseshoe municipalities outside of Toronto, mm -hmm. we've all been behind. So we anticipated that the numbers would be lower. Um, but because uh, the way that the, the, the province is proposing in that that one version of Schedule 3, which has the interim forecast, they're proposing to keep the old 2031 and 2041 numbers, but then add the new 2051 numbers. 
So it makes it for an appearance that um, in the low scenario, our employment numbers are actually declining to 2051. Um, which isn't accurate and is just a reflection of that the province is really trying to combine the two different forecasts, the, the existing Schedule 3 with the updated Hempstead numbers. So uh, that's really why the city, our recommendation is saying that either take those interim year forecasts out altogether because it's it's presenting a misleading picture or update them fully to the new Hempstead numbers, which are more, um, more accurate and, and reflect current uh, assumptions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't know where I am in the timing. Jennifer. One more question. Thanks. Um, so the absence of a standard methodology, um, are there particularly across the region, are there any legal implications for that in the interpretation of this stuff for municipalities at the tribunal level? Uh, through the chair, I. Not that I'm aware of. I think the concern and the, the reason why this, the province had initially um, introduced the standardized methodology for all, all municipalities to use was because during the last round of conforming exercises, there was a great deal of debate at the what was then the Ontario Municipal Board about what was the what was the correct approach for municipalities to be using for land needs assessment. So to remove that that confusion and that area of debate, they had the province had introduced a standardized methodology, and that was that was supported and welcomed by most municipalities. Uh, so by removing that, the standardized approach and now having more flexibility, there is certainly a concern that we will be opened up now to debate again on what mm -hmm. is the best approach to take, whether or not that will lead to LPAT proceedings, I, I can't comment. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, when it's appropriate, Mr. Chair, if you could come back to me so I could uh, move a, an amendment to include a statement on the aggregates. And I have a comment about uh, later on this whole market demand approach to land use planning. Thank you. Will do, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Heather, I, I thought, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I just heard you say that um, aggregates were not permitted in the Greenbelt protected area. I understood that anything to do with infrastructure um, could be developed in the rural area. And I say that because we, I mean, we have lots of aggregate uh, um, locations in, in Flamborough and indeed in the city of Hamilton. And we spent nine years in our community fighting the St. Mary's proposed quarry on the 11th concession. And the only reason that we won that battle, well, there were several reasons, but um, the previous provincial government put an MZO order on that land, which we now know can be removed at any time. So can you please speak to that? Because I, did I hear you wrong? Or can I get some clarification, please? Uh, certainly, through the chair. Uh, aggregate extraction, what I was referring to, is not permitted within um, the uh, habitat of endangered and threatened species within the Greenbelt Plan area, which is the amendment that the, the uh, province is proposing to make to allow extraction within that feature right. within the growth plan area. Within the Greenbelt Plan aggregate extraction, you are very much correct, is certainly uh, permitted. There is you know, restrictions and there's a great deal of um, study and uh, protection and mitigating factors that need to be considered, but it is permitted within the Greenbelt Plan area. Um, just not within those certain features that are now being amended. And I appreciate that clarification. I think it's, it is an important one, um, certainly with the species at risk. And again, that proposed uh, St. Mary's quarry up on the 11th concession, there were a number of species at risk identified, which again, you know, assisted us, um, you know, small little community beating the big corporate uh, aggregate and winning. So I'm quite prepared to second the motion if I can hear the motion that um, the councillor, councillor from Ward um, is going to bring forward. But uh, I absolutely would oppose any, any aggregate locations uh, within areas where there are uh, species at risk or a significant environmental uh, hazards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So back to, oh, Councillor Danko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's, I don't know, maybe I'm just tired this morning, but it's just exhausting trying to keep up with 
the amount of changes that uh, the Ford government is is implementing in planning policy, um, trying to dismantle basically long standing uh, protections that have been put in place um, in favor of development. Well, it's it's I'm exhausted by it, and I can't imagine how our staff feel who are constantly having to bring us updates on this BS that keeps happening. Um, so obviously I'm frustrated, I'm tired, uh, and and like Councilor Wilton said, kudos to your staff for trying to keep on top of this, getting their comments in in these ridiculously short windows that are put in place on purpose to limit discussion. Um, I do have a couple questions for staff. Thank you for the attitude. Um, so Dr. Lukasik talked about this being um, extending the timing horizon to 2051, kind of being a, a roundabout way to force municipalities to expand urban boundaries in, uh, in ways that they might not if they're planning to 2041. So through you, Mr. Chair, to, uh, to Heather, um, does that seem kind of, would you agree with that assessment or, or you know, by going to that longer timing horizon, we're planning for higher population, higher um, uh, employment use, which would necess necessitate an urban boundary expansion. Is, is that reasonable? Um, through the chair, I, you know, I think it's fair to say that, you know, as, as we expand the planning horizon and we add the additional um, population jobs, whatever scenario the province lands on, that growth needs to be accommodated somewhere. It certainly does. And um, we will look at through the MCR about how much of that growth we can accommodate through intensification. We will maximize that to the extent that we think is reasonable and achievable and through increasing densities. But uh, there is, we do know that the growth needs to be accommodated. So if it, if it is identified that we need urban expansion, uh, increasing the population and forecast may result in a larger expansion area being required. Through you, Mr. Chair, th this work's already underway here. We're, we're well into our MCR grids too. So how will this impact the work that's already happening? Uh, through the chair, so we're we're right now in process of looking at our, our project timeline to see what, uh, what the impact of these changes uh, is going to be. It's a little bit difficult to say right now because we don't know exactly when the province is going to finalize the amendment and, and finalize revised methodology. We're hopeful that they will move quickly on it because they know that municipalities need to get moving on their conformity work. Um, they have not, the province currently hasn't changed the deadline for when we need to complete our municipal comprehensive review, which is July 2022. So urgently we do need to be moving forward. We are still right now hopeful that if the province does finalize the amendment, finalize the um, updated methodology, we can um, we still, by the end of this year, have a land needs assessment updated and prepared to present to committee and council. So there certainly will be, there is a delay, um, but we are hopeful that the province moves quickly and then allows us to um, do the work that we need to do to update our process. And through you, Mr. Chair, these constant changes, were, are we hiring consultants that are part of our reviews or are we doing all this work in-house? Uh, through the chair, we do have consultants working with us on the, the Grids 2 and MCR project. Uh, we have one consultant that is um, uh, somewhat uh, seeing more of the overall project and will be helping us uh, when we start to look at evaluation of growth options if it's determined that uh, we do need to consider urban expansion. And then we have another consultant that is uh, completing the land needs assessment for us. So they are they've retained and they've been working with us on the project to date and will be continuing to do so. And if we're constantly changing the scope of what we're asking our consultants and our staff to review is, is this costing the city of Hamilton taxpayers money to constantly have to recalibrate and uh, you know, change what they're investigating? Uh, through the chair, there may be budget implications. We're still reviewing that. Team. Thank you. Just a couple of other questions, um, Chair Farr, if, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Heather, you talked about in your presentation the, the cost of planning for growth that doesn't occur. 
So statistically, the further out that we're planning and the further out we're projecting, the more inaccurate our projections are, obviously. Can you expand on the risks to Hamilton taxpayers in particular of planning for growth that doesn't occur? Because it's my understanding that we're already, you know, um, being forced to plan for growth that hasn't occurred. So this would just be compounded up to the, you know, 2051 and, and the inaccuracy of being able to predict populations 30 years out. Uh, through the chair, um, yes. And, and for that reason is why we did put forward the recommendation that uh, we would ask the province to revise the way the policies are currently worded to essentially not require the city to uh, designate and plan for that last 10 years of growth, rather to um, identify more of a high level strategy for how we may be able to accommodate the growth, but not go to the point of designating land just for the reasons that you mentioned that it's very difficult to uh, predict that far out and um, we want to be able to do some monitoring and see how we're growing and where we're growing in those first 20 or so years to see, you know, before we make decisions on that, that later part of the, the planning period. So we are putting forward that recommendation. Um, the, the problem with planning for growth that doesn't materialize is that we'll be making infrastructure, or well, our development charge bylaw will be based on um, a certain amount of growth uh, being planned for, or being assumed, and infrastructure investments will be made based on that growth. And if the actual growth does not materialize, we will not be able to um, essentially recoup the costs or, or recover um, uh, the expenses that have been outlaid. And we'll be looking at uh, you know, debt financing future growth and just the, all the related implications that that can have on the city and ultimately that may, the risk is that maybe then pass down to the tax. Uh, Thank you. And final question, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. On, on that same theme, the, the cost of taxpayers, um, my understanding when we went through our development charges uh, revisions, we, we update our development charges every, every few years. So if we're if we're projecting much higher growth than actually occurs, those development charges for developments that are happening today now would be lower than what they would be if we actually adjusted for, for world growth. Is that, um, am I remembering that correctly? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, are you suggesting that the fixed cost, so the numerator might be say a million dollars, then it becomes what's the denominator? Is it 10,000 or 20,000 units? If you go to 20,000 units, you divide the million by 20,000, you end up with a lower DC charge per unit than if you were only planning for 10,000 units. So under that scenario, if you're assuming that you're gonna have a high growth in your denominator, your fixed costs are generally more or less the same for trunk level infrastructure because it comes in sort of big clumps. You end up with that situation where the per unit charge is lower than the actual rate of growth, which then sort of leads to what Heather was alluding to, this stranded debt situation where the developer on a per unit cost is not actually paying their fair share of the cost simply because growth does not occur. We as staff have reiterated that message on multiple times to the province that even if they do give us a growth number, we have to be able to, we can have the fiscal carrying capacity to accommodate that growth and to achieve that growth. Otherwise, there's a transfer of the cost of development from the new growth to the existing uh, taxpayer in the sense that the city will have to then use property taxes to pay for that debt associated with growth for that growth does not occur. So as part of this sort of exercise, it's not only a fiscal impact assessment of looking at growth, but also what is the risk associated with that growth in developing the, you know, any sort of growth evaluation criteria that forms part of our GRIDS 2 slash GRIDS 3 update that we are dealing with. And that is part of our concern with planning to a 2051 time horizon. You are essentially planning over 30 years, which would be the life of you know most people, their working careers. And it's very difficult if we have to commit to things that may not materialize over that time horizon. You know, a fixed stationary asset, such as the sewage treatment plant, there may be benefit for them understanding what future growth scenarios are. But when you start getting into linear assets and on the ground growth identification areas, once you make that commitment, it is very difficult to go backwards. So, and there is a financial risk. So that was part of our recommendation to say that we may have to think about growth past 2041, but don't force us to move an urban boundary for growth past 2041. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Um, 
and like I, like I said off the top, I, my, my frustration is that these provincial policies are deliberately putting the costs on our existing city Hamilton taxpayers in order to um, finance and fund the future profits of the development industry. And it's, it's just wrong. This province, this provincial government, just they need to stop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Back to Councillor Wilson. I uh, believe she has a, a motion. Thank you. And I'll certainly look to the Councillor uh, Partridge who has the experience dealing with this for the, the language. And even if she wanted to move it, because obviously I won't have this in my word one. So um, suggested wording would be that the city of Hamilton does not support any permissions for aggregate, aggregate extraction or quarries as this these are incompatible with crucial habitats. Okay, seconded by Councillor Partridge then. Any I, speakers? I would just one? like to like to make sure Councillor Partridge is okay with the wording. Councillor Partridge. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanna make sure that it, that the language reflects and perhaps we can work on this with staff between now and council that it reflects that it um, uh, motion to prohibit quarry operations within the green belt with species at risks. So, you know, I, I think we need to we need to, to have the green belt included in that and we need to have species at risk. Um, Heather, could you just comment on that? And I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to move this if Councillor Wilson would kindly second. Heather? Uh, through the chair, yes, I think maybe we can we can work on the wording um, going forward. Yeah. There's no concern right now, but the Greenbelt plan is, um, the amendment is only applying to the growth plan area. The Greenbelt is um, already okay. protected in this manner and there's no proposals to change that. Um, but I think maybe we can work going forward on the exact uh, wording that we can send to the province um, in relation to the growth plan area. And here I we can do that between now and council then. Yeah, and I would appreciate that. Although, <laughs> I mean, having gone through nine years of this fight, I will tell you that uh, aggregate is allowed and um, they'll find a way around it. So I really wanna make sure that we do cover off, you know, an appropriate, and I get this is for the places to grow um, and not the green belt legislation, but um, uh, let's work on that. But uh, if we can just deal with the motion, that would be terrific. And, and I thank Councillor Wilson for bringing it forward. Okay, uh, Lisa Chamberlain, our clerk wishes to suggest something. So our options with that amendment are that the wording has to be like approved today so that I can put it in the committee report or we approve as is and there's amendment at council. Yeah, an amendment at council would work. Okay. Yeah, is that okay with you, Councillor Wilson, Councillor Partridge, having it uh, prepared for council? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just don't want it to, to get lost. So um, we can work with we can work with Heather. Heather, if you can draft something appropriate. That would be great. Councillor Wilson, good. Uh, I'm fine with that because just it gives us, uh, Councillor Partridge and myself, frankly, another time publicly. So <laughs> I think the more people hear about it, the better. So I'm, I'm fine with that. And also, yeah, not wanting to get uh, it lost, but. Okay, Councillor Wilson moves to receive the staff presentation seconded Wilson. by Councillor Partridge. Oh, uh, Councillor Wilson. Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Chair Farr, I, I did note that I, I wanted to make a quick comment and it is sort of in line with what uh, Councillor Danko was eloquently saying. I am uh, really dismayed and I hope uh, those who enjoy uh, walks in our greenery can understand that this uh, government is actually is absolutely taking this whole market driven approach to land use planning is is nothing other than a Walmart approach to planning. It's a drive through approach to planning that is completely devoid of anything other than consumerism and demand. It's devoid of the things that local governments and all governments need to be held accountable to for and need to advocate. And those are other values um, such as resiliency, um, care of our, our vulnerable ecosystems. Uh, it is about our social cohesion and how we plan. It's about how we move around. So this whole market-driven approach to land use planning um, does not bode well for our future and in fact is a really, a really, really regressive approach to land use planning, uh, which ignores all the evidence of what makes for healthy, um, sustainable development. So it's, it's 
really regrettable, but um, increasingly not surprising from this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, move to receive the staff presentation moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Partridge. All in favor? Carried. I think we've um, we've uh, exhausted our discussion. Yeah, we've exhausted our discussion uh, portion. So I need a mover and a seconder to um, approve the recommendations before us. Moved by Councillor Partridge, seconded by Councillor Danko. All in favor? Just uh, just for the record, uh, vote to receive uh, Heather's presentation moved by Councilor Collins, seconded by Councilor Pearson. All in favor? Partridge, we're on to motions. I like this one, the Water Down Heritage Walk commemorative plaques. Am I on? Second You're on. Chair. Um, I just want to uh, to bring to the clerk's attention, though, this is not a notice of motion. This is now a motion. It was okay. a notice of motion at the uh, at the last planning committee. So it's moved by myself, uh, and I do need a seconder for it. If I could, uh, Sir Pearson, thank you. Um, where uh, And this is for the water down. Heritage Walk commemorative plaque. So whereas the Waterdown Business Improvement Area and Flamborough Archives and Heritage Society, in partnership with the city staff, are planning a Heritage Walk event for the community of Waterdown to attract tourism and promote the Heritage District and whereas commemorative plaques for various heritage buildings are estimated to cost 25,000, therefore be it resolved. The general manager of finance and corporate services authorized to transfer $25,000 from the Flamborough Capital Reserve to a heritage resource management project for the purposes of producing and installing the various plaques required at Waterdown Memorial Hall, Waterdown, uh, sorry, Memorial Park, Waterdown Memorial Hall, and uh, throughout the Waterdown Village Heritage District. And I'll speak to it very briefly, if I may, sir. Um, sure. This is a project that I've wanted to do for, uh, well, for the past 10 years. And uh, there's, when we count up the different areas throughout Waterdown, there's, um, uh, and Flamborough, quite frankly, there's uh, currently about 12 to 15 plaques that uh, would be most appropriate to put around the town. And Waterdown, as you know, is a very, very much, um, you know, a, a heritage uh, community. Uh, as well as Flamborough and uh, important to the development of our, um, you know, our economy, our businesses, our, our, our history. And so I was absolutely delighted to meet with staff and the suggestions, they're quite enthusiastic um, and we have some of the best heritage staff going. So uh, the planners are, are currently just starting to do some preliminary work on it. It is my intent to involve the uh, community in this and the various um, heritage organizations, uh, um, history teacher at Waterdown High School and others. So I very much appreciate if my colleagues will uh, support me in this endeavor. Thank you. All right, and that is seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Good work, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Am I saying that right? Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, general information, Jason, do you have any updates for your planning committee? Jason Thorne, our general manager of planning and economic development. Uh, through the chair, no, I do not have any um, updates for committee, um, although I do understand Councillor Danko may have wanted to raise some questions about the recent minister's zoning order. So if he wishes to do that, then I can, I can speak to that. Sure you can. Councillor Danko? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as committee is aware, um, on Friday, we found out that the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing 
issued, issued a minister zoning order for the former psychiatric hospital lands, which is um, property that's kind of in behind the St. Joe's West Bend campus, uh, across the street from Mohawk College. Uh, a minister zoning order is basically the nuclear approach um, where the minister is able to overrule our local planning authority and uh, institute whatever zoning they want for this property. Uh, since then, I've had a number of calls from um, people involved with the development industry, and the, the fear is that this property, the province already has a plan for this, and this property is being set up to be sold to the highest bidder um, with no regard for uh, local local plans for this property. As committee will recall, um, back in, uh, I think it was 2017, this council, the former council, initiated a comprehensive study for this property. It was very well supported by the community, and it led to uh, a, a negotiation with Councillor Whitehead that would see nine and a half million dollars worth of affordable housing come to the city of Hamilton. The plan would have seen um, uh, this property developed into a really key educational institutional employment center which would uh, be part of Mohawk College, part of the St. Joe's West Smith campus, and also part of our future planning for uh, in employment growth in our city. Um, it would have also seen the maintenance of community green space and uh, the use of the Niagara Escarpment, which this property is adjacent to, and of course, uh, complete adaptive reuse, reuse of Century Manor. So as of right now, because of this unilateral decision by the province that had absolutely no consultation or uh, prior notice to either the city of Hamilton or Mohawk College or any other interested parties, they basically just dropped this nuclear bomb on us. And uh, you know we really have limited options to what we can do at this point. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the latitude there. If I could just go to General Manager Thorne. Um, the, there was a, an information update issued to uh, to committee and the council. Maybe the general manager to, could go through with with what is in the information update and any uh, further information he's had with his discussion with uh, the ministry ministry staff. Jason. Yes, thank you. So through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, we did provide an information update to council uh, once we heard that the minister's zoning order had been uh, announced. Uh, that is up on the on the city website. If any members of the public want to view it. Um, in effect, what the Minister's Zoning Order has done is um, it has added new permissions to those lands uh, to permit residential uses, single, semis, towns, and multis, um, which were not previously permitted uses. So the uh, the city's zoning, uh, which permits uh, uh, generally a focus on, on institutional uses, those uses remain. Uh, and then in addition, what the Minister's Zoning Order has added new permissions for residential on top of that. So um, we have not had any further clarification from the province in terms of what they now intend to do um, now that those additional residential permissions are on the land. Um, it doesn't apply to the entire land, but it does apply to most of the former Hamilton psychiatric lands. So there were some lands towards the back of the property along the escarpment brow that are uh, some hazard lands, natural heritage land that had previously been dedicated uh, to the city. So those remain protected. Uh, and there is one parcel um, uh, fronting onto Fennel uh, where the existing, I think it's like an ambulance dispatch center um, is located. That's not included, but the rest of the property would now have these residential uh, permissions. Um, so we have been seeking clarification from the province as to what this now means in terms of their plans for the lands. These are provincially owned lands. Um, so uh, we don't have that clarification yet other than in a communication to um, to council from the province uh, middle of last week, um, they had indicated that they are looking um, to at least a portion of the of the lands uh, to be used for long term care. Um, that is a priority of, of the provincial government is provide opportunities for long term care. So that does appear to still be part of their plans, uh, but we don't know at this stage uh, the extent to which long term care would be part of the, uh, the, the plans for the site. Just one further clarification for me, if I may, and then um, any other committee members have questions is on the multi-residential side, specifically, what is the permission that the province put in place and what would that allow on that property? So through you, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna throw that question to, to Mr. Robichaud uh, in terms of 
as I said, the, the zoning order speaks to singles, semis, towns, and multis. And in terms of the definition of multis and what types of densities that could uh, accommodate, I'll ask Mr. Robichaud to respond to that question. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a multiple dwelling is defined in the City of Hamilton zoning bylaw as a building containing four or more units. And in terms of height, it would permit up to an 18-story building on the property. And there could be multiple 18-story buildings on this property. There's no restriction on the number of multiple dwellings on this on a lot. So you could end up with a situation with multiple 18-story buildings being developed on this property based on the minister's zoning order. Thank you. With no say from City Hamilton. Once that's in place, it's up to the province. Uh, that is correct. The use would be, the permissions would be there for that use. The city's involvement would be, they would be required to go through a site plan application, but in terms of permitting that use, that use would be permitted as of right in terms of allowing multiple 18-story buildings on this property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. I have a question for Jason too, and it may be of interest to you, Councillor Danko, as a member of uh, the Board of Directors of the Art Gallery, if I'm not mistaken. So if I can pass the chair to you. And Jason, I have received a communication from my constituent, uh, Shelley Falconer, who's the President and CEO of the Art Gallery. Um, it's essentially an issue they have with uh, special event rental. They have a, a massive tent. Uh, with this uh, tent um, in and over the sculpture garden, they provide um, um, obviously increased safety uh, COVID protocols. It is also a rain shelter for their outdoor weddings, which they are happily telling me they have begun booking again. Um, over the sculpture garden, it's also proposed to be used uh, for their restaurant partner, uh, for performing arts and other businesses who require outdoor space to help recover their businesses. And the AGH tell me they're delighted to collaborate with uh, our community to stimulate post-pandemic recovery. So they're doing a great deal, uh, almost getting back to normal, it appears, and it all hovers around this tent. Uh, the issue, though, Jason, is uh, with the building department right now, and I'm wondering wondering if, uh, uh, given all the good things, uh, bringing uh, the art gallery back to life, there's something we can do as a committee here today, uh, even if it's direction to the building department. And, and what, what essentially is the issue is each and every event they're having to apply, uh, though the tent is consistent. Um, they're having to uh, reapply for a minor variance or application uh, or a separate permit for each event, which obviously adds onerous time costs uh, uh, to have to deal with the city and it's uh, prohibitive uh, to the Art Gallery of Hamilton or so they've shared with me. So is there a way to just uh, not have to go through this onerous task every time something occurs underneath a tent that's, that's always there and one that they're maintaining with uh, their partner, and I don't have the name of the organization right now, through the tent. Is there something we can do to help accommodate the Art Gallery of Hamilton, uh, given what I just said through you, Chair? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Chair, um, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you today. Um, I did get sent that yesterday, and I understand what their, what their request is. Um, our zoning permits temporary uses, um, but only to a limit of, uh, of five, five days. consecutive days. Um, so my understanding is that's what's been communicated back. Um, uh, but I do want to go back and take a look with staff in terms of what um, what the zoning issues are um, around the location they've identified. Um, it is important to note that when you that larger tents like this do require building permits, um, they do have to be um, erected in accordance with the, the building code for for obvious uh, public health and safety reasons. Um, and of course, that triggers a review of the zoning permissions. So. Um, uh, with, with, with committee's indulgence, I would need a little bit more time to, to go through with, with um, building and zoning staff to understand um, uh, if, there, if there's um, an approach to this that doesn't require application within the temporary use provisions, because as the council councillor noted, those do have, uh, that, that provision does have a time limit of, uh, of five consecutive days. I'll leave it with you then. Thank you very much. And I'll report back to uh, Shelley, uh, the president and CEO, that uh, it's in good hands and uh, we'll, we'll treat it as a priority if that's okay with you, Jason. I'll take the chair back. Councillor Wilson. <sighs> <laughs> Councillor Wilson. Uh, 
Sorry, I'm not getting any audio from you, Councillor. Unmute yourself, please. How about now, Mr. Chairman? You're good. That's perfect. You're good. Thank, thank you. I have a similar issue uh, and uh, that I know Mr. Thorne is aware of. Uh, we have a... Um, We, ha we have a temple in, in Ward 1. Um, they're concerned, obviously, about uh, COVID and small children. And so they're trying to move their classrooms outside, uh, which I commend them for. They're being inventive and careful. And we're running into the same, perhaps, issue. So I think it's going to be broader beyond uh, Ward Ward 1, where, or Ward 2, I beg your pardon, where they, they may be requiring a building permit, depending on the type of... Uh, of, uh, the tents that they put up. So I, I look forward to this continued discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, anybody else? Move to receive Jason's general manager's update. That's moved by Councillor Wilson and seconded by Councillor Danko. All in favor? We don't actually need it because there's no oh, there was no action, so we don't need a mover or a seconder. So I'm just looking now, I think, for. Uh, motion to uh oh we're going into closed session okay possibly okay one moment committee sorry okay all right so uh, i do we want to go into closed session I, it's um one item i believe and it's um uh report ls20021 looks like an update until made public the city's position uh for lpat uh and the remainder of the report and its appendices would remain confidential so anybody want to go into camera or do we want to wave uh councillor wilson I, I i would appreciate that privilege i i have one question that i need to ask in camera so we will move into camera thank you we'll do and um Where's the uh, in-camera script? Oh, all right, a mover and a second to move into closed session. Moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Uh, pursuant to section 8.1, subsections E and F of the city's procedural bylaw 18-270 is amended and section 2392, subsections E and F of the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended as the subject matter pertains to litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the city and the receiving it advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. Moved by Wilson, seconded by Pearson. Uh, members of the public, the meeting will continue following closed session. Uh, the meeting, uh, when you see the members of committee rejoin the meeting, that's you know when we're back. Uh, the committee will wait up to five minutes upon reconvening in open session before proceeding with the meeting to provide members of the public and the media time to return as well. So into closed we go.
Yeah, did we need to vote electronically? No, it was from Collins, seconded by Pearson to come back into open session. We got quite a clerk's team here today. So it's a real powerhouse here. It's quite something. We're gonna get you to lunch on time. I need a mover and a seconder to approve the recommendations A, B, and C contained in the report LS 221 slash PED 19186A, uh, remaining confidential until made public as the city's position before the LPAT, and that the remainder of report LS 200121 PED 19186A and its appendices remain confidential. I'm assuming Councillor Wilson, would you like to move that? Seconded by Councillor Danko, all in favor? to adjourn today's meeting. And that is seconded by Councillor Partridge with a thumbs up. All in favor? And while we wait for the vote, I just want to thank uh, our clerks today once again for doing a phenomenal job keeping this meeting uh, on time. And Unanimous.